Welcome to Carbon Removal Newsroom for July 1st, 2021. As always, I am joined by Holly Jean Buck, Assistant Professor in Environment and Sustainability at the University of Buffalo. Hello, Holly. How are you today? Wonderful. How are you doing? Well, survived the epic heat, so happy to report that Seattle is still standing after that, though some concrete buckled here and things like that and plant and leaves literally burned. It was, it's been an interesting week, but we're back to normal and that's good. And I'm also joined by Chris Barnard, Policy Director at the American Conservation Coalition. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm doing great, nice and cool. <laughs> oh, it's never a good sign if DC is cooler than Seattle in June. And Radhika Mugafkar, that's me, Head of Supply and Methodology at NORI. So today we will be discussing, as promised, the Growing Climate Solutions Act. And I'm curious about its future in the House because there are some rumblings that it's not as popular over there. Also, we'll talk a little bit about the carbon soil marketplace and other carbon removal technologies. Are they ready for prime time? Are they even viable still? And finally, some carbon tax proposals are moving forward in Europe. So what does that mean for the US and the rest of the world? I'll start with the Growing Climate Solutions Act. And Chris, I'll let you kick it off because I know it's a really big deal for your organization. And maybe you can give people an overview of what it is and, and go from there. Absolutely. Well, the, the Growing Climate Solutions Act was passed a week ago today um, in the Senate. So it's not into law yet. It still has to go to the House. But um, it left the Senate with 92 votes in favor, only eight votes against, overwhelmingly bipartisan. Um, and so it's, it's essentially a, a two-pronged um, bill. Um, on the one hand, it seeks to create a certification process for um, carbon credits, for carbon markets to be more efficient so that farmers and landowners um, can be connected with companies to sell carbon credits and be paid to sequester carbon um, and so there's a certification process there that would seek to streamline the market and give kind of institutional backing to these carbon credits, which has been a little bit of a problem in these markets until now. Um, and the second thing is that it would create a, a program through the US Department of Agriculture uh, that would essentially provide technical assistance to farmers and landowners to um, help them figure out the best ways for them to sequester carbon. What are the kind of technical things that they can do um, how do they go about it? How can they actually make money from these credits using um, land management practices, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's, it's been really cool to see that Democrats and Republicans are coming together on this issue. Um, interestingly, uh, at least especially from my perspective, is that more Democrats than Republicans voted against it. Um, and the Democrats that voted against it are um, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Ed Markey, and, and uh, a few others. And interestingly, they were they were joined in their opposition by uh, James Inhofe, who's kind of the, the infamous Republican who brought a snowball to the Senate floor to disprove climate change. Um, and also Josh Hawley and Mike Lee, who neither of them particularly uh, are particularly fond of this concept of climate change. And so just a really weird paradox that you saw these super progressive Democrats that like the Green New Deal is their thing, unite with climate skeptic Republicans to oppose a climate bill. Um, so I know I, I kind of um, had some schadenfreude about that this last week, but yeah, that's that's pretty much the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Yeah, it's it's like bipartisanship causes strange bad fellows, right? I mean, who would have guessed? But over maybe Holly, why were those Democrats um, kind of against this bill? I read that Cory Booker vetoed it too, which was a surprise because of small farmer in environmental justice concerns. So maybe you have a little line into what they're thinking. Honestly, I'm not sure about that part of it. My read was that it's, I mean, there's two things basically going on. One is an opposition to offsetting and to carbon markets more generally. So the idea that some polluter is gonna get off because there's some, um, you know, carbon is being sequestered by the farmers. And then secondly, concerns about efficacy. So will this actually work? Will it do anything? And kind of what's the point of facilitating an offset market without a cap? And so I think that if you're looking at this act as an alternative to something better, 
then sure, it doesn't look that great, but it isn't clear to me that there was this other great thing on the horizon that this was substituting for. So personally, I feel like lukewarm about it, like fine. I mean, it's something, right? What, why are you a little lukewarm? What more would you have liked to have seen in the bill to make you? I mean, I think some people were thinking about this in the frame of what do we need to do to decarbonize agriculture, which is, you know, a much bigger um, conversation. And, you know, then you need to focus on things like fertilizer overuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the different parts of the system that are producing emissions. So this wasn't that, I mean, this was something else, so. Yeah, the flip side of that is, and I should disclose to anybody who's listening who may not know this, Nori is a is a voluntary carbon marketplace. We launched in regenerative agriculture, so in soil carbon sequestration. So I might be a bit biased. I might not be my usual objective self. That being said, you know, some of these regenerative agriculture practices will force some of the changes like reduced man-made fertilizer usage. It moves it over to manure. You, you, the practices themselves should help with some of these larger questions around emission reductions by their very nature. So it, it is a surprise to me that anyone would be against it. I can understand being wanting more, but it's a good starting point from, from my perspective, at least. So it'll be interesting to see whether it can generate enough interest that we can start within the farming community and actually see some significant changes in the way they approach farming. But before we pivot too much, I wanted to talk about what its chances are of passing the House, because I've also read that there's some significant opposition in the House. So um, Chris, what have you been hearing about that and and why would they be opposed to it exactly? Well, the, the primary opposition in the House, um, at least on the Republican side, is coming from Congressman G.T. Thompson from Pennsylvania, and he's kind of the ranking member on the Agriculture Committee, and he's concerned that it would essentially push small agricultural practices and small family farms and things like that, put them at a disadvantage compared to bigger farms that would be more able to take advantage of these types of carbon credits, um, and I, I don't think that's a particularly strong narrative because as far as I can tell everyone can benefit from this equally and the whole point of the technical assistance is that smaller and big operations can learn from the U.S. Department of Agriculture how to sequester carbon effectively um, but that's kind of some, one of the main oppositions to to the bill in the house but I mean I, I think it will ultimately pass and we're definitely working and trying to get G.T. Thompson's team to to come out in favor of it and and we're definitely doing our best to try and get Republicans to to support the bill. And I think the fact that 92 senators in, in the Senate voted for it is pretty huge, especially considering it is overtly a, a climate bill, growing climate solutions. Um, so hopefully we can kind of pull off something similar in the House. Are there any, um, have you heard of any Democratic House members who are also opposed to it or too early to know? I mean, I would presume the same crowd as kind of Bernie, Warren, Markey, like, I wouldn't be surprised if like AOC votes against it, because there there was, there were over 100 progressive environmental organizations that wrote a letter saying that we should oppose that these, sen these senators and members of Congress should oppose the bill because it somehow perpetuates a system where people can just offset their carbon and not reduce it themselves and things like that. Um, so I'm sure there'll be pressure on, on her and some of the kind of the more progressive flank of the Democratic Party to vote in line with Sanders and Warren, um, but I hope it's just not strong enough to kind of cave the entire bill. Yeah, they, um, they're certainly pretty, they're right now, I think in general, quite vocal. They're not super happy with the infrastructure bill either. So it will be interesting to see um, how they how they approach this. In, from my humble opinion, it's, it's a start, right? And it, even if it doesn't reduce all emissions in the sector, it's the right direction and we should be supporting things that move us in the right direction that both parties agree to. And traditionally people within the space that would be opposed to environmental regulation are actually embracing because it's a nice combination of the private and public coming together. But there is also the question, and I think Holly, you kind of were alluding to this so we can kind of move on about whether regenerative agriculture even is worth the hype. By some estimates, it has the ability to sequester about 10 million tons of carbon dioxide globally 
per year. But the question is, is that enthusiasm maybe a little misplaced? Or, I mean, the fact is the fact, but is the enthusiasm that we can make it popular enough that it meets those goals? Is it misplaced? What do you think? I mean, I don't think it can sequester 10 billion tons globally per year, but I think it could do, um, you know, a couple billion if there was a very massive, very socially complex undertaking to get farmers to work in concert towards this goal. So I think that would be pretty unprecedented. I'm not sure we have the social infrastructure to do that. Um, and the other thing I would say about, about the, the prospects is, is that it's the science is still pretty complex. So soil is really complex. It, it's influenced by all these microbes, by land management, by climate, by soil type. And so figuring out what's going on in the soil can be an expensive prospect. Um, and people are hoping that we have other methods to measure it that'll be cheaper, you know, using satellites and modeling. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do there to even know what's going on. Do you think that by finding a place to start, it's the only way actually to push the science? I mean, that's my viewpoint is you've got to You've got to start someplace and move directionally the right way, knowing that it's going to change. I think the flip side of that argument and the thing that I think about a lot is that if you if you do that and you tank spectacularly, you could kind of blow up the whole the whole system before it even gets started. So I don't know if either of you have any thoughts about that. I don't think the silence is no. <laughs> no I think I think that it, you know this time is really critical because if there's big problems or big missteps by actors right now, and it sours, you know, people's mood on it or sours investment, then it's not clear that we get another chance right away to kind of reinvent the concept. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I what I think about is the fact that um, we, we all have probably read that article about the region network out of Australia, they um, created a uh, carbon credit system that Microsoft bought and claimed seven tons of carbon dioxide per hectare in Australia, which blew many people's minds. We'll see if they meet those projections or not. I would say for our listeners, Nori averages about 0.55 tons of CO2 sequestered per acre of land in the U.S., so vastly different scales. And if that fails, will that mean like a Microsoft is out of the, that marketplace. I think about that a lot. And then if soil is complicated, as far as I know, other types of nature-based CDR aren't even, aren't even close. So I don't know if either of you think about industrial DAC as the next solution, which has its own issues, but curious if either of you think about those as the way to go next, be our next focus. Yeah, I mean, that's something we've talked about before in this podcast is like, should we focus just on natural solutions or just on technology? And I mean, I think we kind of all settled on the fact that you need a bit of both to be able to kind of most effectively address it. Um, obviously, it, it comes from different sources. You farmers and foresters and whatnot, they won't be involved in direct air capture, at least like technologically. And so that's that's more kind of something where the Department of Energy would be involved in kind of funding early stage research. Um, and then also there seems to be interest from some kind of the major fossil fuel companies who who seem to think that if they get this technology to be to be more effective enough that they can actually capture their emissions and continue using certain fossil fuels. So I mean, I, I certainly support like the investment in it and and trying to get there. And and I think that it is important to kind of complement the natural direction with a technological approach as well. I, I just don't really know like what the economics are behind it at this point. Yeah, I mean, there was that article that was saying that, you know, we need to kind of follow the cost curve of the solar solar industry, you know, upwards of a few multiple hundreds of million or a billion dollars worth of investment from the government. The huge assumption, of course, being that the technological curve will follow the solar curve, which is an unknown. But Holly, I do have a question about kind of DAC and its use in to create quote unquote carbon neutral fuels through enhanced oil recovery. So to me, that seems like the absolute moral hazard that we talk about a lot in terms of, I mean, it's not technically removal from the air, but point source capture. Uh, wondering 
what your thoughts are about that. And when they make these big announcements about, you know, capturing carbon dioxide only to use it to create quote unquote carbon neutral fuels. Yeah, I mean, my worry is that this is going to crush public support for DAC. And so I just want to differentiate for listeners that there's different ways of getting to what's being conceived of as a lower carbon or carbon neutral or possibly carbon negative fuel. What we've seen recently is just pairing um, fossil fuels with offsets. To So that's one formulation, right? And then you can actually turn CO2 into fuels, DAC to fuels without you know, dealing with, with the oil industry quite so much. That's another separate thing. And then you can have a process where you have direct air capture and um, use that captured CO2 to inject underground into a depleted oil well and get out more oil. And then that product ostensibly has, you know, a different life cycle analysis, carbon neutral, possibly carbon negative very context dependent. But so there's a lot of stuff going on within this whole realm of lower carbon fossil fuels that I think is very, you know, confusing <laughs> to people. Um, and very problematic in terms of having people's first introduction to this technology be from the fossil fuel industry, which is basically socially toxic. Yeah, I mean, I think that was sort of what I was trying to get at when I, which I didn't do very eloquently, honestly, is that there's so much hype around the soil marketplace within the Biden administration and within the U.S. And it, and I'm, I'm wishing there is hype around DAC, but I'm not hearing it quite as much. Maybe it's my own bias. I don't know, but I feel like the government needs to be thinking, and I think they are, but needs to be more visible and vocal and hopefully the, also the Senate and the House around these in, non-nature-based solutions and figuring out and helping the technology develop. Because I kind of fear the same thing you talked about, Holly. It can't be an oil and gas creation. It's got to be a neutral creation. Yeah, and it might actually be too late for that. I mean, there's been tremendous advocacy around carbon capture use and storage, CCUS, from the fossil fuel industry. And I'm very worried about what that means for direct air capture because it's all being conflated. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I I was I I made that same um, point to somebody I work with just the other day that he's like you can't don't say it like this and I'm like but but that's how the government talks about it so we've got this weird um, conflating to your point that people don't understand all the subtleties and honestly I'm not sure that I do even though I work in it because it is so complex and there are so many things happening all the time. Finally today, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the carbon taxes that are coming up. And so Chris wanted to, hopefully you can explain to our listeners what carbon leakage is, which is kind of what is driving carbon taxes across the world, I guess. Yeah, I mean, carbon leakage is essentially the concept that emissions can rise in one country because climate policies or measures or regulations are super stringent in another country and cause business to go to this this country where the regulations are less stringent because it, it it's easier to do business and as a result they go there and emit and emit carbon emissions there rather than in the original country and then you've not actually solved the problem of trying to reduce emissions in the first place and so um, this this applies to regulation like making it very difficult for um, companies to pollute, say, in the U.S., and they might go to other countries. But it was it would also apply to, for example, um, if you introduced a carbon tax at home, and so you, you would start to uh, tax the emissions in the United States, then companies would just get up, leave the United States, and go somewhere else where they can conduct business without being taxed for their emissions, and then sell products back to the U.S., and then completely bypass the system. Um, and so, so it's interesting, the IMF did this blog post mm-hmm. uh, talking about how um, the only way to overcome this would be some kind of global minimum price floor for a kind of global carbon tax to avoid this type of leakage. Um, and, and that would essentially make sure that you can't just produce dirty goods in one country and then export them to a country with higher climate regulations. And then ultimately you don't solve the problem. So um, that's kind of the concept of carbon leakage. 
And what do you, and what do you think of that uh, global carbon floor price? I mean, I think it's utterly unrealistic. We can't even get a carbon tax in the U.S. or in basically most other countries in the West, let alone get a carbon tax that the entire world would agree on, let alone at seventy-five dollars, which is incredibly high. So, yeah, I, I just don't think it's realistic at all. It's kind of like a an IMF theoretical blog post more than anything else. Um, but it does bring up this valid point of we should think of measures to try and ensure that carbon leakage doesn't happen. And that's that's a real conversation that needs to be had. But I think it's completely unrealistic to think of a, a globally enforced carbon price minimum. Are those conversations happening right now in the U.S., Chris? I know they're happening in e the EU, obviously, but uh, what's happening over here? To, to have a carbon tax, you mean? Or? No, just about carbon leakage and policies to ensure it, especially when you've got NAFTA. I mean, we've got competing interests, let's just put it like that. So have, have these conversations even started? Yeah, I mean, Biden's kind of talked about how he would be in favor of some kind of carbon border adjustment, which mm -hmm. means that goods coming into the US would pay a certain amount of money depending on how much carbon is created in the production of those goods. And that's essentially to prevent carbon leakage. And so he's talked about that. Um, and the EU is kind of heavily like in discussions to put a system like that in play, which would probably give political and international cover for Biden to do th something similar. But when the EU pushed Biden over it at the G7, he was kind of a little bit hesitant. Japan was also not very interested in it. So I'm not, I'm not sure if there would be some kind of global agreement, but there would probably be kind of a domino effect if the EU does it. Um, and, and if the EU and even like the UK or another major economy would do it, then there would be some a domino effect because the US would have to kind of think of, of the fact that now they can't really export to the EU much because there's no reciprocal agreement on that. So I think there, there, there might be kind of a, a first mover advantage that is necessary here to, to make this happen rather than waiting for some agreement that everyone can agree on at the same time. So Holly, I think one of the criticisms of this, right, is it again will disproportionately impact countries that have been less involved in polluting, but now, you know, basically the global south. What is what are your thoughts about this tax? Which I think is there's some tension there between equity issues and sustainability and global warming issues. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the carbon border adjustments, I think that on one hand, on at first glance, there's a right reaction like, oh, it's good to make our new green industrial infrastructure competitive. But there's a really good um, opinion piece this week published in Tech Review by Arvind Ravikumar. And he discusses how really, I mean, he says unilateral carbon border adjustments merely represent the latest form of economic imperialism because the global north has financed these fossil fuel plants in the developing world. They've outsourced their manufacturing there. Um, and he says, you know, it's hypocritical to, promote, to promote that kind of development and then punish developing countries for their emissions. So I think that that's a, a strong argument that we need to be thinking about. But then, you know, then the follow-up question is though, how do you then ensure that the cost of carbon is somehow part of the goods, right? So that it drives transition to new types of technologies that are cleaner. I don't know if there's an answer, but if either of you have a thought about that, I'd love to hear what you're thinking. I mean, some of the proposals that I've heard coming more from the pro-market conservative side is obviously a kind of carbon border adjustment or global carbon minimum price would be kind of a stick approach. And so the opposite carrot approach would be to get rid of all the um, trade barriers to the free trade of environmental goods and services. So that would be kind of physical goods like solar panels and wind turbines and nuclear technology and all those kinds of things, but also services. So financial industries that are specifically working on climate issues, um, knowledge, workers, things like that. And um, there's, there's a strong argument that by getting rid of those trade barriers, you would actually provide a huge kind of boost to the global market for different countries to trade these technologies and to um, kind of have a, a flow of information between them. Because right now, it's actually pretty incredible how high the tariffs are on some of these things. And that obviously stymies 
it, it's kind of forcing each country to come up with the technology and the things for itself rather than sharing the burden. And in Germany, you might be good at kind of a certain technological aspect in Japan, something else in Australia, something else in the US, something else. But right now, each country kind of has to do it by itself. And so if you can share that, um, I think leveraging global trade in the direction of clean energy would actually be a pretty powerful alternative to this type of uh, policy. Yeah, that's a great idea. Holly, anything you want to add or include? I mean, maybe some of this stuff would be more equitable if it was paired with more climate focused wealth transfers. That's all I've got to say on that. <laughs> I think I think what we realize is it's a as as everyone knows, a very complex issue. There are competing, you know, competing interests even within even within groups that are all supportive of sustainability and moving forward in terms of carbon removal and different types of clear, greening up of our infrastructure for lack of a better term. So we'll just continue to talk about it and hope that someday we get where we need to be. So finally today, for my little good news piece, and I'm just putting you both on notice that we'll probably talk about this more in depth next week, is the White House did send a report to Congress about developing carbon capture usage and storage, as Holly mentioned earlier, CCUS. Um, and that's technologies that, well, in the statement of the White House, both remove carbon dioxide at a point source, like from a power company, or remove carbon dioxide directly from the air. And so this is at least to me a step in the right direction that we are starting to look more broadly than just soil and, and supporting technologies that need innovation from the government. So I'm looking forward to seeing what that report causes Congress to do and maybe some node bills will be drafted, time will tell. But with that, I will say thank you to both of you for again joining me on a lovely carbon removal newsroom and i look forward to talking to you both next week oh and enjoy the fourth of july weekend you know let's see some fireworks this year hopefully you'll all get to enjoy that um, as we emerge from covid so take care everybody thanks for listening bye <laughs>